This is the Conscious Economics Podcast. Your co-hosts are two women who found themselves in careers on Bay Street, but decided that there was something missing. So here we are. I'm Rhiannon Roseland. I'm your co-host and the CEO of the Economic Club of Canada. I'm also the co-founder of Conscious Economics. Hi, I'm a SEAL, the CEO of Conscious Economics and a financial therapist. Now, we call ourselves economic healers, and that is a term that I'm sure nobody has heard before, but we really believe that if we want to heal our systems and create a more equitable society, it starts with actually healing our relationship with money and the economy. When you join us on this podcast, you'll be exposed to courageous conversations that help us examine, heal, and redefine the relationship we have with money. Join us on this journey as we co-create the new economy together. Welcome back to the Conscious Economics Podcast. I'm Rhiannon. And I'm a SEAL, and we've prepared a great topic to discuss with you today, and that is the psychology of scarcity. A lot of the topics I'm going to discuss with you today are actually based on the readings I've had from a book called Scarcity, Why Having Too Little Means So Much. Mm. So break it down for us. Explain to us a little bit about what is even scarcity for those that may not understand what that term means. Yeah, so scarcity is living in lack. And when we're talking, obviously our podcasts are more focused on the concept of money. But in this specific uh, concept and the studies around it isn't just focused on financial scarcity. It's the concept of scarcity in general. Mm -hmm. And that refers to scarcity on time, which if you're living in North America, who doesn't experience that? Mm -hmm. Uh, But also scarcity of relationships, which as we become more uh, addicted to our technology we are lacking more and more social connections and social ties uh, and that is becoming a real real issue scarcity Mm -hmm. of connections in general people are lonelier than ever Mm -hmm. Uh, so when we're talking about scarcity it's the lack of whatever it is that you value in your life right absolutely well and I think fundamentally our whole system is really based on this scarcity mindset and scarcity idea of that there's not enough for everyone and because we hold that belief system so deeply there's not enough for everyone and that is what we are experiencing in our reality whether we like it or not we've all sort of you know subscribed to that that belief system absolutely Mm -hmm. so the psychology of scarcity it's actually exploring how people's minds are less efficient when they feel like they lack something so like we said earlier whether it's time whether it's relationships another thing is calories actually that's another one when people are on diets they actually are their moods are different but also their cognitive abilities are different so uh, it's very important to understand how our actual brains are functioning differently and there's different case studies i've brought to share with you today to rep to really show this data uh, and how it plays in action so the scarcity mindset actually um taxes are bandwidth so we all have a specific mental bandwidth we wake up with a specific reserve Um, if you have scarcity that reserve tends to automatically be less than somebody who's not living in that Mm. and that's something that automatically your starting point at the beginning of your day is just not the same as everyone else's so brain power uh, is is definitely uh, consumed and the three areas that are impacted as a result of that is first is dealing with priorities so essentially things that are tend to be less pressing concerns just fall off the table Mm -hmm. second is planning ahead so the ability to have future oriented vision that is also wiped off Mm -hmm. your mind and the third is problem solving so when you're living in scarcity these areas are very very impacted Mm -hmm. uh, by by that How do we know if we are living in scarcity? Is it really about the quality of our mental chatter? And, you know, are you hearing, you know, your thoughts become negative around like, I won't have enough money to do this. I will never, you know, be able to meet a partner because there's no good people in the city. Like, is that, is that, how do we know if we're in it? I feel like the emotion, our emotions are a very massive uh, guidance system for us. Mm-hmm. What's really sad about this is we lost our ability to even understand and connect with our emotion. We're living in such a rushed society in a very, our nervous systems are so uh, wired that even our ability to connect to what's really happening sometimes is in itself challenging. Mm-hmm. But emotions are, are one of the ways we can 
uh, tune into and, and figure out how we're feeling about certain things. And if we're feeling anxious or stressed or rushing or depressed, or these are all guidance for us to understand like this there's something off about this area um, and naturally that helps us understand when we reflect further why that is and and often scarcity is an is a reason for it mm-hmm. so um when you are a, a person who's aware of their life it's not hard to identify where there's lack in your life mm-hmm. and it's a lot to do with situations that you're constantly having to deal with so when you're constantly tight on time you find yourself saying things that i'm busy all the time i'm rushing all the time i'm I'm, um, dropping balls all the time so these are all evidence that you're living in a scarcity of time Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for example yeah so emotions and circumstantial evidence yeah okay very interesting hold that thought we have a quick word from our partners before going back to the episode This podcast is brought to you by our sponsor, RBC Investees. Backed by expert human advisors, RBC Investees is a smart, online, automated investment service that allows you to invest with low effort and low cost. Open your first RBC Investees account and pay no management fees for your first year. Plus, start investing with as little as $100. Simply visit rbcinvestees.com slash getinvesting and sign up using promo code AA407. And now back to the episode. One thing I want to focus on, uh, let me actually share the study and then I'll tell you about the concept of tunneling. So there's a mall case study that was done in New Jersey. So they asked participants in the mall to fill questions so that they can measure their fluid intelligence, which is a component of your IQ. Um, And they gave them two scenarios, two financial scenarios. And these are things that are speculations. It's, it's It's something you're solving that's not a legitimate or a real issue. It's a, it's a game you're playing, but they gave them two scenarios. To one group, they gave them a scenario where you had a minor car issue where your damage was around $150. And the other uh, group, they gave them a hard problem where the, you know, all the challenges amount to over $1,500. What they found is the fluid uh, intelligence that was measured on that day was much lower to those who were given a harder financial situation to deal with rather than those who had like $150 to deal with. So to to be more specific, the poorer people in the mall actually were like, if if you were in a poor category in life in general, then if you were given the harder problem, your fluid intelligence automatically dropped on that day. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that was dealing with a game not even a real life situation mm-hmm. so you can only imagine how much more your cognitive abilities are taxed when you're actually dealing with this in life and that's a real issue mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. this is it's really really interesting to bring this up and to talk about this because again I know for us you know we're not just bringing these things up so we can have a chuckle about it and be like oh that's an interesting random fact it's really kind of getting into how systemic scarcity is is born and and that we are when we're in that state of mental deficit how the deficit reveals itself in our reality so that we literally have less brain capacity to be able to problem solve if we are in this constant state of worrying about basically our survival is really what it comes down to and it's um it's really really interesting to see and it's something that when I've been doing the work of working with young people across Canada for the last 10 years and kind of rooted in financial literacy, we were realizing that those that were coming from backgrounds of uncertainty or economic distress were having that cognitive you know, decline. Like we were presenting, you know, even gamified scenarios, but there was a stress indicator that was happening that, and this is where conscious economics was born and mindfulness and money, because we were starting to realize that we may be doing more harm than good. Um, And that is, I think, something that is so important for us to realize that depending on where we've come from and what we've experienced in our lives and where scarcity has shown up in our lives, that is, is a very tender 
a tender piece that we need to really, really be mindful of mm-hmm. when we're working with different groups. It's really great you said that. That one of my favorite takeaways from that book is the some of the solutions they were presenting about scarcity proofing our policies. And what that means actually is arranging policies for the poor so that they can actually be policies that work. So when you you can't charge somebody specific amount of money uh, for food stamps because the whole point is that they actually have no money so so there's certain programs that are structured in such a way that work against what they're trying that work against the solutions they're actually trying to to solve another thing for example is actually demanding somebody to be at a specific time for a specific date let's say they're coming out of jail and they're going through rehabilitation program or the if or it's let's say a single mom fighting for custody for her children and needs to be a certain uh, court dates or certain times like there are certain things that people are dealing with when they're coming from specific backgrounds and dealing with specific economical situations where if you're looking at the policies and some of the things they need to do it's not even set up for success for them Uh, whether it's time commitments financial commitments uh, even sometimes, you know, as as easy as showing up for a class that that, that is imposed on them. So taxing their bandwidth uh, is just not enough. And creating a solution that's bound to fail uh, is because we're not informing our um, policies with the psychology and the behavioral sciences that need to be associated with some of these things. So they actually are designed to to work but just to go back to the case study that i mentioned before um so so the new jersey mall study even though there were significant differences in how people responded given the situation they were given uh, the some of the weaknesses of that case study is that you are dealing with a whole variety of people with a whole different background different education different uh, different iq levels so you're not really measuring um accurately the impact of financial scarcity specifically because there's a lot of other variables in play Mm -hmm. so to address that problem what the researchers did is they went to india to to study uh people who actually are in um architectural how do you say that word no uh argita like the farming architecture agriculture (laughs) yes yes okay that so so now they're actually studying the exact same person right. before People harvest. People are all in the agricultural Yes, before industry. harvest and after harvest. Because before harvest, that person is poor. After harvest, that person is rich. Mm. So you're studying the same person. So you're eliminating all the other variables mm. that played a role in the mall study. And mm-hmm. the, I found that really interesting because that's a very smart way of approaching that. So mm-hmm. what they found in that experiment, which controlled all the other variables, is at the end of the day... Um, so after the harvest, which when people are much, much richer, they, uh, hold on, let me just find what I was looking for. Okay. So the difference in the IQ level were 10 points different before they harvest than they were after the harvest. That's so interesting. But that sort of goes to show you what a satiated or a safe nervous system can do because it just does free up so much more capacity if we're not in worrying about our basic survival needs and this kind of goes into Maslow's hierarchy of needs and this understanding that if we can fulfill some of our basic most fundamental needs that then we can keep moving up on the ladder of enlightenment or self-actualization and so this kind of comes to that same theory or point that you know those that have more um, or are living you know not in scarcity have this ability to self-actualize and to do some of these other things like there isn't actual cognitive capacity when our brains are wired for survival so that's called tunneling actually Mm. tunneling means you you're um, when you are taxed, your bandwidth is taxed. You're capable of focusing on whatever falls in your tunnel. So your vision, your your ability to uh, think about certain things becomes so focused, myopic, mm-hmm. and it's within a tunnel. And tunneling is such an important concept to understand because when you have limited cognitive space and what bandwidth, you're only capable of devoting time and energy and effort to to understand what's in the tunnel. And I'll give you an example a story actually that stuck with me to even illustrate how important the concept of tunneling is. So 
uh, firefighters, for example, when they are called to a situation, to an emergency, they are dealing with a scarcity of time. So it's an instant uh, scarcity situation that they're dealing with. Did you know that most firefighters, um, this, this research was done in the U.S., but I would imagine it applies in North America in general, don't die on the scene of the fire. They die on their way there. And do you know how? Mm-mm. Because they forgot to put their seatbelts. Mm-hmm. Now, this specific a uh, firefighter would never not wear a seatbelt if they're driving their family car or they're driving any other car. Mm-hmm. But because of the scarcity of time, their tu- the, the vision becomes tunneled. They're tunneled on the, the location they're heading to mm-hmm. and the situation they're dealing with that something as simple as wearing your seatbelt becomes dismissed. Mm-hmm. So 25% of um, deaths in the firefighter departments are actually on the way to the emergency wow, versus on the wild. emergency. That's so interesting and a really good way to you know illustrate the example um so what do we do if we find ourselves in a situation i mean most of us in the modern working world Mm -hmm. are in the scarcity of time uh framework for sure like i certainly am not sitting around thinking i have an abundance of time and that it's just you know at my leisure like these are real things that we're all battling with so what do we do so there's few things but one of the most important things to understand and actually one of the most striking findings that was um concluded from these studies around scarcity are that people who Uh, are dealing with strong conditions of scarcity are just as capable as those who aren't. It's just that these capabilities are hindered and taken away from them in these conditions. So it's important to know because there's also this concept that, you know, the stereotypes that poor people are just less smart or, or less capable. When in reality, it's not that they're actually less smart or less capable. It's just the situations they're dealing with taxes their bandwidth so much that they are performing poorer as a result. It doesn't mean they actually are if they were given different circumstances. So that's an important thing to identify. Uh, for example, research on the use of cell phones in itself in the car uh, tells you, because now your your bandwidth is stacked so heavily, how it's comparable to being legally drunk. Mm. Uh, so essentially, it doesn't mean that you're not a good driver uh, but if you're not drinking alcohol, obviously you drive better. But also if you're do- you're not on your cell phone, you're driving better. So it's important to f- the first baseline to establish here is that we can have um, much better capabilities when we take away these these restrictions and limitations so how we do that is first acknowledge where these limitations are to start so if it's a time limitation how can we carve more time in our life if it's relationships how can we cultivate better and healthier and and meaningful relationships in our life so the first any any exercise we do really um is really starting with an inventory awareness inventory if you will maybe we should like trademark this name Awareness mm-hmm. inventory. <laughs> Awareness inventory. So looking at in your life where these areas yeah. of scarcity show up. So where do they show up for you? I definitely, the, the time one I resonate with a lot, um, especially when I was working in the corporate world, I was very, very taxed on on time. Um, when I, I no longer have, knock on wood I used to battle with an eating disorder and around that time I had a calorie scarcity I had such intense guilt of of, and I would count every calorie and whatnot and the the amount of restrictions that had posed in my life was tremendous Mm -hmm. so definitely that and even though I don't deal with money as scarcity today I have a history of that that still um, lingers and I have lots of close family members that also deal with that firsthand and it's a continuous struggle so it it i feel that money scarcity mm-hmm. as well so mm-hmm. these are three areas i feel that are dominant in my life yeah absolutely yeah i i mean i still suffer from money scarcity i still i suffer from the time scarcity absolutely um and probably many others and i need to do my inventory and see where they're showing up but i think it's important for everyone listening to realize that um you know, you're not alone, first of all. I think so many of us are suffering um, from this lack mentality or mindset. We can change it. It's, it is within our capacity to change. And for one of the things that I know, because as an entrepreneur and being in a situation where my business ebbs and flows and 
I've obviously just been struggling through um, the pandemic where our business was seriously impacted. And what was happening is I was feeling the mounting pressure of all the problem of like all the, you know, the revenue issues and the pandemic and the unknown. And it was getting me to a point where I was dog paddling in that survival mode, being in that tunnel vision, not being able to even dream up a solution because I was just in panic mode. And once you're in panic mode and you're in that negative spiral, everything starts to reinforce that like falling sort of feeling. And that's exactly what's been happening for me. And where I'm trying to catch myself is like, pausing looking at one day at a time and really saying like today am I survive like can I survive today can I survive today can I find that sense of security in today I don't have to have all the answers but what do I need to answer for today and try to take off the you know worrying about the future to such a degree when you don't have control anything can change tomorrow mm-hmm. is really the reality but we're that's so where mindfulness practices come and play and yeah. it's a huge mindfulness practices are one of the best tools that you can start infusing in your day to help you deal with scarcity mm-hmm. uh, but because it's such a wide range of scarcity that we're talking about each of them have a different way to deal with it it'll be very different if you're dealing with financial scarcity versus relationships versus time for example each would be dealt with differently the idea is to become aware of it first and then commit to uh, finding solutions to that so to tackle that but most importantly becoming more compassionate with yourself when you make mistakes and realize that you know we're so harsh on ourselves and self we are our worst critic always so it's important to realize that you know i didn't do the smartest thing i would have done here but you know, I can only do so much when I'm taxed all the time and I am capable to improving my decisions and my problem solving skills and all these things when I'm able to cultivate compassion and mindfulness on my day to day. Yeah, I think it's it's a really, really interesting topic and one that I'm really glad that we were able to explore. Yeah, there's so much more to it, obviously. We're just planting seeds here, but we'll get deeper into it in future episodes. But uh, please feel free to feel free to reach out to us for any comments or questions or stories that you'd like to share with us because we're always interested in hearing from you. And you can visit our website to learn more about our movement, ConsciousEconomics.ca. And any last words, three? We'll just see you next time. Thank you. Bye. This podcast is brought to you by CPP Investments. At CPP Investments, they never lose sight of the long term. They invest the Canadian Pension Plan Fund to help provide financial security for generations of Canadians. They diversify the CPP fund across geographies and asset classes to access the best investment opportunities and generate sustainable long-term returns. The fund is now more than $400 billion. To learn more about their investment performance for Canadians, visit cppinvestments.com.